Randall Schwartz. I gave a presentation a couple days ago. Some of you were probably in that. Uh, none of this talk will be redundant with that talk, so it's all different material. And I know you're anxious to get out to the party tonight, so I won't run any longer than my allotted time. Uh, as I said before, I tend to speak rather quickly. I apologize in advance to the translators and to those who do not speak English natively. So let's talk about DART. First off, you might have heard a lot of things about DART already. And unlike what some people say, it's not just a smarter JavaScript. We already have a few examples of those. We have TypeScript and CoffeeScript, which are both things that are currently being translated to JavaScript before they run in the browser. We also have ECMAScript 6, which is coming along, which will add a number of new features. These are all great, but they still suffer with backward compatibility with old JavaScript. All the things you've learned to hate about JavaScript over the years don't get fixed by these solutions. Some of the things will get, uh, get fixed, but not enough, I think. It's a modern language. It looks a lot like Java or C++ or any of those other modern languages that you may be familiar with. There's a native VM that compiles extremely fast and runs really fast, actually being built by the people who built the V8 JavaScript engine, so you can tell it's going to be really cool. And we use that native VM for development because there are hooks in there to allow us to watch every variable and check out each, every subroutine, see what's uh, being executed for code coverage, all sorts of things. And we also can use it as an application deployment platform, just like we would use Node.js. It would be for things, say, have a, a web server written in Dart that uh, performs high, perf high uh, performance uh, things, the same way we're doing Node.js now. This is one of the biggest things I'm looking forward to because I don't exactly like JavaScript, in case you hadn't figured that out, but this Dart language being used in place of all that Node.js stuff is going to be really slick. Another thing that's interesting is it supports pound bang lines. So you can write a script completely in Dart and put the right pound bang line on it, and it will compile and execute the same way a Ruby script or a Python script or, yes, a Perl script would do as well. It transpiles efficiently to modern JavaScript, to JavaScript that runs in modern browsers. This is great for single-page applications. In fact, this is sort of the impetus to get Dart going in the first place because you don't want, you know, the modern way of doing things is REST API calls and a single URL at the top of the screen. You're not going flash, flash, flash back to the server every time to completely reload your page. So think of things like Gmail or Google Maps. Uh, and this is why Google is really excited about this because they'll now have a modern language that will work this way and actually to also phase out all their GWT stuff, which is what a lot of that is written in. And it does run in all modern browsers. Sorry, IE, I think it's 9, is not a modern browser according to Google. So uh, there is a cutoff there somewhere. And I know there's a lot of IE 9 still out there. Um, nothing I run would ever run it, but uh, <clears throat> a lot of people still have it. So that's, pro that's a problem. It's going to be a problem for all these uh, modern architectures. IE9, just get rid of it. Find a way to get rid of it, please. So what is Dart? Much of points about it here. It's easy to learn. It looks a lot like everything else you know. There's no real surprising things in the language. It compiles to JavaScript, which means it's good for both client-side and server-side applications. As I mentioned, you can replace Node.js and other applications like with this. You can also replace all of your other client-side applications and frameworks with this. It has really great tools. It's actually somewhat mature, as we'll see in the timeline, but you have really great modern IDEs that work well with Dart. And here's an interesting feature. It supports types without requiring them. I'll show some examples of this in a few minutes. But this means that you can give all sorts of control to the programmer, and uh, which will then in turn be reflected by the IDE. The IDE will know that this object can have these 17 methods and display them to you in a pop-up if you give types there. If you don't give types, the IDE just goes, ah, I don't know what you can do with this, but you know, here, try something. It scales from very small scripts to very large, large applications. Uh, internally, Google has replaced a number of their applications with Dart already, and they're finding that it really works well for large teams of developers. It has a wide array of built-in libraries. I'll get to that towards the end. It supports safe and simple concurrency with isolated threads. So instead of this share always and have to lock everything kind of motive, it uses mailboxes essentially. So you push stuff into a thread and you pull stuff out at the other end. So you have essentially worker bees that are doing the actual work. This means there's no deadlock, no locking, no thinking about how it works and how it only sometimes works. It also supports code sharing. 
This means that we, there's already the equivalent of the CPAN for Perl, and I'm sure there's the equivalent of that for Python and, and Ruby and things like that, Ruby gems. Uh, but that's already in place for Dart. And there's already 3,700 packages there. So it's not like there's nothing to pick from yet. And it's completely open source, the compiler, all the tools, uh, except some of the proprietary tools. But all this is open source, so you can get inside of it and see how it works. Uh, it, the Dart compiler is written in Dart, which is one of those interesting things. How did they do that in the first place? They built a smaller compiler and then just kept coming bigger. So Dart was founded by Lars Back and Casper Lund of Google. Dart was unveiled in October of 2011. So this is not a new project. It's been around for a while. But Dart 1.0 was finally released in November of 2013. That's when things started to get interesting because we had a solid uh, release. It did all the things we wanted. The tools were there. Uh, some of the infrastructure wasn't. A lot of the documentation wasn't quite there yet. But it has been around for at least a couple years now. Well, almost a couple years. Now here's the good part, too. It's not just Google's baby. Google doesn't drive it anymore. The core language is now part of the ECMA 408 standard, which means that when Google wants to make a change in the language, they have to go to the committee and say, we want to add this thing. We want to take away this thing. We want to do something, right? So the standard body, of course, has Google on it representing their, their interests, but there's a lot of other people on that board as well, very smart people, in fact. So to make things faster, Dart 1.6 came out. I'm leaving out a few of the minor releases was released in August of 2014. And this allowed us to have an application that slowly, incrementally uh, loads itself. This meant you could, if you had maybe some part of your application that uh, was not used for the core case, it just wouldn't load that extra code for you. So uh, load as you go. Dart got running on the Google Cloud in November of 2014. So yes, you can go to the Google Cloud and deploy your Dart applications there with great scalability and pretty decent prices. Now, in the initial release, in the initial discussions of Dart in the first couple of years, the goal was to have all the browsers add the Dart VM directly in the browser. And after a while, it was decided that they, wouldn't, they weren't ever going to get it into Safari or get it into Chrome. Well, of course, Chrome, because that's Google, but uh, not into uh, Firefox and the other things. They weren't going to get it everywhere. So instead of having this sort of two-level thing where you have some stuff that's run by a Chrome with a Dart engine in it and everything else is running strictly as JavaScript, they've now said, nope, we're not going to put the VM in any browser except for the development browser that we give you in order to test your uh, client-side programs. And that's essentially Dart inside Chrome, so they call it Dartium is the name of the browser. And that ships with the SDK. So instead, they're now working very hard and focusing entirely on making the Dart to JavaScript translator be smarter. That means it's going to be improving all platforms now, not just having Chrome be way out ahead of everybody else. And I think this was an important move. To some people, they saw that as, oh, D uh, Google's no longer behind Dart. No, that's exactly the wrong takeaway. The right takeaway is that, in fact, they're now going to be better on all platforms. And I really appreciate that. Uh, a new release came out just a few months ago uh, that had uh, enumerated types and uh, better support for asynchronous operations. I'll get more to this in the later. They also uh, extracted out from the IDE that they were shipping, they extracted out the on-the-fly code analysis tools. This means uh, being able to do syntax highlighting, being able to tell when you have a bad method call at compile time, being able to tell all these cool things once you put the right typing information in, being able to tell, for example, that you're missing a semicolon while you're typing. So this is what the other editors are now using behind the scenes. They have one standardized on-the-fly code analysis tool with a good API, and it's really slick. DartPad, I'll get to that in a few minutes too, but think of uh, JS Fiddle or one of those things that you can type a quick bit of JavaScript in and run it and show it to your friends and share it with your friends or test something out. They've just released DartPad, and DartPad does the same thing for Dart. And you can simulate both command line tools and web-related programming, all in a browser that you can then link to and give to your friends and share with, with stuff. It's just it's a, totally amazing. I'll demo that, actually, in a few minutes if the uh, network holds up and not too many people in here are streaming. OK. It, they also had the first Dart Developer Summit just, uh, it was just last month, no, two months ago. No, this is July already. Time flies. Okay, in April 2015, I'll just say that. 
And the third edition of the spec has just been published. Uh, they're adding some new features. They're adding uh, a couple of really interesting things, like they're going to make it so that you can declare that a variable will never have a null in it. And this apparently saves some of the uh, computation time in the JavaScript side. So if you want something that can't possibly ever be null, initially has a, a real value in it from the day it's born, then uh, you can actually speed up some operations. That's probably not going to hit. Uh, I think the spec has almost been approved and, uh, oh, it's published, yeah, and it, but they won't get built into the language for another maybe six months to a year. You can get it in the development versions, but not the, the real live versions. So I mentioned DARPAD. Let's see if it actually fires up. There's my link to it there. Pray to the gods of the internet. Ooh, look at that. Look at that. So I'm going to make this bigger. Don't worry. Embiggen, embiggen. There we go. Now you can probably see it. So over here on the left-hand side, we have command line Dart code. And it has a variable going from 1 to 5. And over here, we have what the standard out would be from that command. But to show you this isn't just a canned demo, let me change this 5 to the number 21. No, I meant not that 5. How about 11? And I hit run. And now it's all gone all the way to 11, except yeah, it scrolls right there. Now, that's all available for free and works right away. But here's also what's cool. We can come in here. Notice this coloring and highlighting as I'm typing. But I can go down here and do I dot. And it gives me a pop-up list. This is, this, is, this is really cool. It gives me a pop-up list from that code analyzer of all the possible um, methods that I can add there. And it does a lot more things like that. It's really, really slick. So it also has uh, samples of the HTML version. Let's see. Let's do hello world in HTML. Work, network, work, 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 work. There we go. And so this is a little longer. This is the dark code that's actually going to put hello and the number three, or just the number three into a particular uh, space. Where did it get this space from? It looked with query selector to go find pound count. Now, where did it find that? It found that in the HTML that also got loaded with this page. So here's hello world, and here's a span id equals count. So it's going to put the text right there. And in fact, it did. You see it right here. Here's the HTML output, right? So this is the example of what your client-side code is going to look like. It's going to have an HTML piece to it, and it's going to have a Dart piece to it. And then those both get shipped down to the browser. Actually, the JavaScript translation of the Dart will get shipped down to the browser. But you can play around all day in here. They give a few more samples in here. But you can change this and, and play around with stuff, or you can load your own code in here. The only thing I would, the only thing I would uh, be very cautious of is that to compile the Dart code, it sends it to their server. And there's even a privacy notice about this. So don't put anything in there that you don't want anybody else to see. Okay, because the, the, the Dart team is actually going over the code and seeing how this is being used. So, yeah, don't put anything there. And it will all be destroyed in six months, but too bad if you said something for the next five and a half months, right? Okay, so that's DartPad. Oops, don't want to do that. Just want to close it. There we go. Pretty slick, huh? And you can, oh, there's also a share button, and it gives you a URL that you can give to other people to go right into where your code is. So, DartPad obviously is a way to create Dart code and run it and test it out. But you don't want to do that for company, uh, you know, internal secret stuff. So, let's look at the options that are currently available for Dart. WebStorm. Now, WebStorm is a proprietary uh, piece of software. Some of you, that means it's a non-starter. But for, if you're using it for open source projects or in classrooms or to students, for students, you can use it for free. You get a free license. Not, it's not open source, but it's a free to use license. And it is by far the best thing out there for editing uh, uh, Dart code. WebStorm also does everything else. It does basically, it'll do Ruby, it'll do uh, PHP, and it's got amazing integrations and stuff. It's, I think the commercial license is only like $79, and it was well worth it for me because it really changed the way I was able to work. If you're used to IntelliJ, it's a sort of a souped-up IntelliJ. It's even sold by the same company. And speaking of IntelliJ, here's an open source solution. IntelliJ Community Edition also can take this Dart analyzing plugin and work closely with syntax highlighting and things like that. So that would be a good way if you're used to IntelliJ. If you have Sublime Text, again, this is a proprietary piece of software, but the Dart plugin also works on Sublime which means you can get syntax, indentation, highlighting, the code completion, all that stuff that I showed you a moment ago with the DartPad. You can get that with Sublime Text. And then, of course, there's DartPad, zero install. You just go to that URL that uh, I clicked on. 
Uh, you can also use Eclipse, the data that works with the uh, dark, uh, the data that does the analyzing, the data analyzing things. That also fits in Eclipse, so there's an Eclipse a plugin for that. And it's just text. You can use your favorite text editor. So you, you may not have to, uh, you know, buy anything or borrow anything. But the problem is then you miss out on that fancy, cool code analyzer tool, which is, I, I think, amazing. It does so many cool things for me. I can't believe I was just typing stuff in Emacs before. Okay, so now I'm, I'm finally convinced of going to a real IDE. Finally, after all these decades, yes, all these decades. Okay. So let's show you a little bit of code, and I can talk through mostly what it's doing. We have to show Hello World to start with, right? So there it is, except it's really dark, huh? Can you make out some of those letters? It should have been on a white background, I guess. How about that? That make it better? Yeah. Okay. Except we used, lose the color highlighting. Um, but this is it. So it's a, it's every command line application has a main. So and actually, all the website web, web client stuff also has a main. So it works the same way. Uh, and it's typically hello world, right? Well, let's add some stuff to it. And again, that's dark again. I should have thought of that by before bringing these back, black backgrounds. Um, here, I've put, I've created a variable called MSG. Now, this is an untyped variable, same thing as a JavaScript variable. In fact, it translates directly into being that code in JavaScript, or pretty close to it. So that's cool, but let's start looking at typing. So here, what I've done is I've taken the variable person and put the word world in it, and, uh, but I tell it that it's a string. Now, this means that there will never be anything besides a string in there or one of its subclasses. And the compiler can use that to detect methods that aren't able to be done on it. And the runtime can even, if something tries to sneak in that's not a string, will also uh, throw an exception. Also notice here the variable interpolation, again, very much like other languages, very pretty similar to you. Hello, people. So let's go to the command line. Let's actually take an arg off the command line. Now, some of you may recognize I'm doing, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the word now. Um, we specify a type uh, using the stuff around the outside. Anyway, that, I'll, I'll get to the word later, but I forgot what the word is. What is it? Anybody? Anyway, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, generics. There we go. I'm, just get, I'm getting a little older now. Things don't come quite as quickly. So if you'll see here, we have args. We could have just left it with no, with no type. Oops, over here. Could have left that with no type, but by specifying, this t syntax in front of it, we're saying it is always going to be a list of strings. And then when I start using that down below in the main part of the code, my IDE can hint, oh, you want to do a subscript first, or you want to do functions that work on a, uh, on a list. And then once you pull the value out here, arg sub zero, then it's going to say, I know that that's going to be a string. So it will give you suggestions about what, what can be, be done string-wise. And so again, very much similar to this program. And let's refactor that last line of this code into a subroutine. So again, let me highlight it all so you can see it a little bit easier. So all I've done here is I've t made the subroutine say hello to, and it takes a person. And down in say hello to, I've said that person that I'm passing in, the value that I'm passing in is definitely going to be a string. And again, by having that strong typing there, I get a really nice sense of, um, um, uh, you know, what, what my, my IDE gets a sense of what I was intending and therefore can help me out when I say, well, what methods can I call on this variable? There's some hints that are sort of already work out anyway, like when you have var uh, foo equals a quoted string, it will know that foo, at least right now, might always be just a string. So it, 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 it tries to infer some things from that, but it can't guarantee it. And so it, it only gives you that as hints. So here's the important concepts about Dart. Everything in Dart is an object. If you're familiar with Ruby or Smalltalk, this will seem very familiar. In other words, everything ultimately inherits from the object class. Whatever is in the object class, all objects know how to do. That means everything in the program. Typing is optional, but again, provides hints to the tools. And this is very handy because it sort of says, here's, here's what I can do. Typing also provides guidance in checked mode. There's really sort of three modes that Dart runs in. It can run in check mode, which is the strictest, meaning that your code has runtime typing information available to it, as well as the compiler doing all the compile time checks to make sure that it's all correct. You can also just run it in deploy mode, which turns off all those checks, but still runs the code in the same way it would have with check mode on, unless check mode would have thrown an exception. 
When you compile it to JavaScript, everything is off. There's no checking done whatsoever. So, uh, it, you know, you can put an int into a variable that should have only been a string and all sorts of things. So the development cycle is that you run in checked mode while you're debugging and developing, making sure that all the most of the stuff is right already. And then as you go through the deployment process and the JavaScript conversion process, you lose some of those uh, safety nets. But the code still runs the same. And that's the important thing. So the code is completely compiled before execution. This is typical of most modern scripting languages. There's a complete uh, runnable set computed before we start doing anything. It includes top-level functions, as like main is, local and anonymous functions, that would be lambdas in other languages, as well as class methods and instance methods. We'll see examples of some of these as we go along. There's only so much time in a 50-minute talk. <laughs> Privacy is two level, not over this complicated privacy schemes. Everything is public unless it begins with an underscore. If it begins with an underscore, it can only be seen within its own library. So it doesn't matter what level it's at, it can only be seen within its own uh, level. The built in types include all the common ones. Numbers uh, are broken into int and doubles. Uh, strings, or the name is capital string, and it's uh, UTF ready. That'll make you guys all happy, I'm sure, with all the nice letters that you have in your, your alphabet. Uh, Booleans, it's type bool, lowercase b, and the only values are true and false. It has a list, they're indexed starting at zero. It has maps, we'll see examples of most of these. Maps are indexed by objects, so not just a string as the key, it can actually have any object as the key. This leads to some really interesting stuff. And symbol is a string that's identical if it's equal. That's used for a couple of internal things, so I put it there for completion. So numbers. Infinite precision ints as long as you're running in the VM. So that means your server-side code can compute two to the millionth power, and it will work just fine. Probably don't want to do it over and over again, but it will work. Unfortunately, because they didn't want to build an extended math library in JavaScript, slowing down every single math operation on client-side, you get only the normal range. I think it's 56 bits, plus and minus, so not a huge range. The doubles, of course, are the classic IEEE 754 standard, so that should work the same everywhere. We have here um, uh, samples here. So A, oh, sorry, i got to highlight it again. A equals 3. Header constant is 0x, babe. So there's hex constants. Here's a very large integer there, something that's pi-like. And uh, there, I made a double by dividing it by 1e31. I didn't know how many digits I had there, so I had to keep running this code until it came out to 3.14. <laughs> but that worked, 131 does. And here we have at the bottom an example of a short uh, subroutine. A lot of subroutines end up being just one expression, like return this for a getter or something. Well, you can just use this arrow notation here, which is really slick, and you put the single subroutine there. It still takes arguments, though. It's just like any other normal subroutine. You're just declaring that it's only going to have a single expression as its entire body. And that's a really handy thing. It really simplifies writing some of the code. You can also convert between strings and numbers. And here we're going to start to see this odd idea that everything is an object. So we take the int class and say parse the string 3, and we get the number 3. We take the double class and parse the string 3.14, and we get a double. Now we take just the digit six and we're calling the two string method on it. If you haven't seen Ruby, this probably looks really weird. But yeah, numbers are objects, even literal numbers are objects, so they can take a dot call on the end. And then again, just a couple more examples. I'm running slightly behind schedule, so we'll keep going. Booleans, there are only two literals, true and false. Only true is true. Everything else is false. Now, unless you're in JavaScript, then it's the normal JavaScript rules. Okay, so when developing, you can ensure the proper operation before deploying, but if you debug in checked mode, which again, I recommended a few minutes ago, the Booleans, when used as a Boolean, must be one of the two values, true or false. If you're in checked mode and you say if A, and A is not either true or false, you will get an exception. Now, if you say if a greater than 3, and a is comparable to 3 somehow, like it's a number, then it'll work fine because the result of the greater than is going to be a Boolean. 
So this, again, encourages good, well-written programs, but still lets us be fast at runtime, be fast in the browser, be fast in the VM that's deployed uh, for something like a Node.js style operation. Lists, again, known as arrays or ordered collections from other languages. Zero-based indexing, the first element is item zero. So in check mode, it can be optionally typed. So again, let me highlight this so you can see it. This is working exactly backwards of the way I wanted it to be. Because <laughs> I remember from now on, dark backgrounds did not show up. So here I have a variable meats, and I have a literal list, cow, pig, and chicken. And I print meats. All the objects know how to print themselves, some better than others. But that will actually print out brackets, cow, comma, pig, comma, chicken, close bracket. So you get, already get easy debugging with stuff like this. We can also index element zero of meats, and that will be just cow. The, a list, like meats, has an add method, so we can add something onto the end. And now we can get the length here with meats.length, subtract one, and then take that back as the index into meats. And now we're going to get the turkey that we just added. Now, the literals can take type annotations. So here we have none, which is actually forcing this list to be computed as a num list, a list of type num. So now we have only numbers here. The typing information went along with the, uh, the, the value. So it knows it's still a list of numbers only. So even though I didn't specify a type out here in the var, it's still automatically a list of num. That's all it is. It's all it can ever be. So if I try to add a duck in checked mode, again, the mode you're supposed to be using when you develop, it's going to fail. It's going to throw an exception. And does that pretty hard. It goes, yes, I'm down. OK. There's also a rich set of methods, add, add all, index of, remove at, clear, sort, and many, many more things, of course, all the typical things you'd see for an ordered collection. Maps. Maps are like hashes in Perl. I think they're called hashes in Ruby. I don't remember. Python, it's like maps or something. Anyway, I don't know. I don't, I don't use those other languages anymore. So maps have keys and values, again, both objects. Maps are created with a literal syntax or by saying new map, just like we would say new list. Oh, that's coming up next, sorry. So here I have Randall, me. Uh, notice the uh, open and close curly braces. And then the keys here are all strings, uh, name, address, city, uh, and the various values on the right-hand side. And uh, you use square brackets, though, to do the dereferencing. So to get add an element, you still always use a square bracket, whether it's a list or it's a map. Uh, and uh, then I update the value of city. And then I add the value of zip. Now notice this is a number, not a string. Right now, that program will run just fine, both in check mode and uncheck mode, because there's no typing for this hash. So it's an anything goes, anything key, any value, any object on either side of that and it works just fine. But we can go further. We can specify, again, using the, this, this notation, we can specify the um, fact that both the keys and the values have to be strings. So it's two, two different types there, type comma type. That stands for the key type and the value type. So if I had written that back up here in this code above, this last line here, where I try to put the number 97001 into this strongly typed now hash, map, sorry, map, old word, it would actually blow up at uh, either compile time, if it could tell enough about that, or at runtime, if it's running in check mode. So this is really good. It really gives you a lot of power to really define what you think these are. And of course, user defined types would also work in there. Uh, things that are subclasses of the type that you specify also works. If you don't care, you can just write uh, um, var and it just, no object, just put object and then it's any object works there. So if I wanted a map that was keyed by uh, strings but the values could be any objects, I would just put string comma object. Functions, types again are optional, but if they're there, they're used to assist the IDE. Here's a little function here that calls another function. We have the function say my name and it takes definitely a string passed in with my name. So my name is my name, right? Okay. Just prints that out. And I simplified this next one. It's the same thing. does exactly the same code. But notice that now I don't provide a typing information to my name. So now the compiler has no idea and the IDE has no idea 
of uh, what type that might be. Uh, because anything can fit in here too as well. And notice here I've used the arrow notation. It's just a single line, so why not write it in the shorthand form? You'll get really used to using that, and then you'll wonder why it's not in other languages. Okay? And this main code is just a run to actually call the first one. Now, arguments can be positional or named. So here, notice here we have, oh, got the whole thing first, sorry. Notice at the first line there, there's curly braces around a couple of parameters. This means that this whole list of things inside the curly braces are named parameters. We're going to call this subroutine with little names, like down here, uh, first colon Randall, or first colon Randall, last colon Schwartz. And that's going to pass that in. Now, what if you don't pass something in, like the first invocation there? Well, then last is going to be null. And literally, N-U-L-L, -L, that's the value null. And so if last isn't null, we print my name is first name, last name. Otherwise, we print my name is just first name. Maybe I only go by one name now. Okay? So again, pretty straightforward stuff. A little interesting thing there with the name parameters. This was actually uh, borrowed from uh, Smalltalk. A lot of the people that developed Dart also worked on Smalltalk and uh, BigTalk and some of the early other uh, alternate stuff to that. So yeah, really good stuff. Okay, let's do the next page there. Now, args can also be optional. Any of the args that are not inside curly braces are also not inside square brackets, which we'll see in a minute, are required. They have to be there and the values are assigned in. If you have, following that though, uh, you have, here, let me highlight this again, or low light this, I guess. Notice here I have the variable first, and it's not inside square brackets, but we have the variable last, and that is inside square brackets. This means it is a, this is a, essentially a var args function. In other words, if I pass it one parameter, it's going to go into first. If I pass it two parameters, the second one will go into last. And we have that same null thing going on. If it doesn't see it, it will be the value null. And you can also provide a default value. So down there with Smith, notice we have string last and then the equals and then quote Smith quote. That means that if I do not pass a second value, it will default to Smith. So of course, if I say my name to Randall, it's going to say my name is Randall Smith. Not accurate, but for the example, that's what I did. There's a rich set of operators similar to most other modern languages. Fifteen levels of precedence. It's an ungodly number of precedence levels, but it's no, no worse than Perl. Uh, with a normal usage of parentheses to override. Uh, there's an integer divide operator with tilde slash, kind of a strange looking symbol. All the traditional pre-increment, post-increment, pre-decrement, post-decrement functions. Typecasting, type testing with is and as. That's is, is not, and as. Compound assignments, your lovable plus three and times, or plus equals and times equals and percent equals, all those normal ones. Your standard bitwise operators that can work on an int and take out pieces of it. And the traditional question mark colon operator, so you can have expressions like that. You can see Dart's pretty thorough, it's pretty comprehensive. Almost everything you like about other languages is probably in here somewhere. It does take a little bit longer to talk about than because of that. How am I doing? Okay, good. Control flow. You're going to see a very similar control flow for C and JavaScript. Uh, so like if and else, standard blocks, standard sorts of things. We've got for loops. That's a three-part for loop. Uh, initializer, test, and increment. Same, same normal thing from all the other languages. While and do while loops. Switch in case. Uh, there's some suggestion in the manual that you don't use switch in case except sparingly. Uh, I think it's because it's actually implemented as a series of if-elses internally. And so you don't really jump right to the right place like you would in C. So uh, it, it has the same impact, same look, but it's going to take a lot longer to work its way down through the various uh, options. And then there's assert. We didn't show any of those yet, but you can add an assert that has to be true. If it's anything else, it will throw an exception. But when you take off checked mode, it disappears. So you can have a bunch of assertions in your code and have it be self-testing and self-verifying while you're running your code in, in development and debu debugging time. But those checks all go away when you're out at runtime. Uh, so it's very, very nice that way. If you actually want something that'll throw an exception at runtime, you can make one. We'll see that in a minute. Speaking of exceptions, good timing. So 
standard sorts of exceptions, hierarchy of exceptions. Exceptions are, are objects too, so they come out of a hierarchy. And unlike Java, where you have to figure out, okay, I'm calling this function, that might throw these nine exceptions, and I'm adding three more exceptions, so I have to list the 12 exceptions that I might throw. Anybody been through that kind of Java hell? Right, so, no, you just, you just write your subroutine. It just works. Exceptions are typically subclassing from either error or exception. But you can throw any object, which of course means you can throw anything, because everything is an object. And we have the typical try, catch, finally, if you've done any JavaScript or Java programming, you probably pretty well know what those look like. Let me do it good, okay. So again, everything is an instance of a class, ultimately inheriting from object. It's a single inheritance structure, but it does allow mix-ins. So that means you always know what your parent class is, but you might also implement some sort of interface that everybody shares, and that allows you to get passed around better. So new can be used with a class name or a class method. So you can write a factory method that turns out other objects, maybe previously generated objects from a cache or something. Objects have members consisting of methods and instance variables. And classes can also be abstract, and you typically use that on a class that would only be mixed in somewhere. Uh, many operators can be overridden to provide a custom interface. I think about uh, 25 of the operators, like less than, less than, and plus, and times, obviously. Uh, so you can create a rather rich interface for your user-defined objects, user-defined classes. You extend a class with the extends keyword. Class members, oh, here's some code, so let me highlight it. Here's an actual class, it's very small. It's a point class. And it has two member variables, both numbers, x and y. So we use point.x to set the x. We use point.y to set the y. Uh, we create a new point by saying new point. And so this is all rather simple. Now, the compiler knows that this point object here is actually of type point. So the compiler will be able to say, when I say uh, lowercase point dot something, it will tell me that I can call all the things that object knows how to do, because this is inheriting from object, but also it'll know to tell me that I can also look at dot x and dot y. And I can also print it, and why can't I print it? I can print it because I overrode object's toString method. So notice I put a method in here called toString, and internally that's what print calls in order to insert the value into a string and in order to ultimately render it to standard out in this case. So just by overriding two string, you can essentially have a way of showing your object in any way you want. Very nice feature. You can also define individual getters and setters. Suppose I wanted it so that when I got x, it would just get the current value of x, but when I set x, it would make sure that x is greater than zero. I could add the code in there to do that, and it wouldn't change the fact that I still wrote point x equals four down here. It wouldn't matter because that will now be using the, um, the explicit getter and setter that I just created. And in fact, if you define a getter, but don't define a setter, there is no setter. That means you can't actually even modify the variable from the outside of the, of the class. So it's very, very flexible. And class variables and class methods, again, are also supported. You call those uh, static variables and static methods, I think. Some terminology for that. Okay, so why use the generics? Because we can identify, or we can indicate to the compiler that this is only ever going to be a list of strings. So therefore, it will, it will give us hints about what the, the ID will give us hints of the methods we can call on that, but also at runtime, if I am in check mode and I try to do something silly, like put a number in with, as one of those uh, values, it will again abort. So we get the exception at that point. And that's only because check mode makes it that strong. And also use it for interfaces. So here's a kind of an abstract one, a really abstract, literally. Uh, I have here a cache of type T. I don't even know what that type's going to be. I can import this into many, many different classes that need to have a cache of, say, numbers or a cache of type strings or whatever. And I simply have the getter and setter values here. This is, I'm actually overloading, whoops, come back here, come back here. I'm actually overloading the get and set of an array or a hash. So it has that same exact interface, but now it's going to be calling my code rather than uh, calling the original code. 
for that sort of stuff. Okay, asynchronous operations, very well supported, similar to some of the promise libraries you may have seen in JavaScript, like jQuery has a sort of promise thing, there's a generic promise thing now. It provides future as a class, that's one value soon, and stream, which is many values over time style interfaces. And you can use, it's not literally the words try, catch, and finally, but if you've seen those promise libraries, you know that it uses things like dot then and dot on error and that sort of thing. Same thing in Dart. Looks very close to the same code you would use as promises uh, in, uh, and actually I think promises are also in ECMAScript 6, so it's really all trying to st stylize on the same standard style. But for very simple cases, and this just came out in the most recent release, so I haven't had much time to play with this, you can add an async keyword at the top of your subroutine. Inside, the code is expected to block on something, block on waiting for a variable or block on waiting on a stream. And it actually magically transforms this await keyword into the same thing with a dot then and a callback to a smaller part of itself. It just works and it's really slick. Now if you want to do some complex thing of error handling and multiple stream consumers and things like that, probably wouldn't get to it. Probably won't work for that. Libraries. Boy, does it have libraries. The core library, which is imported automatically, has numbers, collections, strings, and lots and lots of stuff. That's sort of the, uh, sort of the, the junk drawer thing. Everything all, all ended up in there. Async, so things that understand streams and futures and all the things around that, and that's a very extensive as well. Math, we've got math and random and all those other cool things in that area. Uh, for any of these that uh, are not Dart core, you actually have to add an annotation in your program that says import Dart async or import Dart math or import Dart HTML. And the reason for that is to minimize the number of libraries that get pulled in just to an analyze the thing. So you, you have to hint to it. Now the nice thing about the JavaScript compiler is that it does tree shaking. So in other words, let's say you pull in the huge uh, uh, HTML library, but you only use one function. Only the JavaScript for that one function and any function it calls uh, will be put into your download. So many times for small programs, you're, you'll end up with a payload with Dart that's smaller than just the jQuery library because it, the jQuery library has to have it all in there just in case you might call it. This is a really key feature for fast deliverability, especially on mobile devices. HTML, again, allows you to access everything about the browser. Really cool stuff there. Create elements, uh, use have full access to the DOM. Dart.io uh, is the equivalent for command line apps. So that's going to give you all the things like file reading and starting processes and all that cool stuff. You can never have a program that uses both of those at once. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Can't do it. Uh, Dart convert for encoding and decoding JSON, UTF-8, and so on. Mirrors allow you to introspect into your program. You can put annotations by a function and have some other code come along and look at it and say, oh, that function is, is a smart function or a dumb function or whatever. I don't know what, how we'd use that all the time. But, but that means you can get at all of the Dart program while you're running the Dart program and look at what methods things have, look at what uh, call methods on things. Very, very clever. It's used for some of the stuff that... Uh, uh, the, the Angular JS uh, or Angular Dart thing and the Polymer Dart thing, they have these annotations to say this is a decoration or this is a component or whatever. It's really click, clever. And many, many, many more standard libraries. The list is about 35 standard libraries, I think. So obviously they're not all going to fit on this page or in this talk. But wait, there's even more. There's the pub. And I don't mean the one that we might be going to later tonight. I mean the pub where you have published packages. Uh, the word dart is a uh, symbol, the, the symbol for it is a throwing dart. And so all the other bits of the ecosystem have tended to take on pub and dart and, and, and drinking things. So it's, it's really sort of staying within the genre. It's just like Perl's CPAN for dart. You can publish shared libraries there. You can incorporate those libraries into your project. And uh, there's a pubspec.yaml file that, that can actually say, I will work only with versions 1.2 through 1.4 of this other pub thing, so people know what I've tested it with. And they can download and view your dependencies when they pull down your pub spec when you've published. And that is the rest of my slides. So uh, a lot more information on the Dart Wikipedia page. That's a great summary. Uh, I followed that for at least a part of this talk. Uh, Dart up and running is a, 
as a uh, online book. The entire contents of the book are online. It's not a free and open source book, though. It's copyrighted by O'Reilly. Uh, so don't steal it for your presentations like I almost did. I forgot you had to read the, what the license was. Uh, there's a news dart. There's a blog that explains about every four or five days something new happens in the dart world. And if you follow that on your, your blog reader, you'll see a lot of stuff there. And of course, the only URL to really remember is dartlang.org. This is Dart's home page, home website. The site is all written in Dart, by the way. So everything you're seeing is dynamically being generated by Dart code uh, to spit out the website. So all they have to do is fix a few things, and then all of a sudden, the entire website changes. It's all dynamically generated. Think of it as PHP, but smarter, a lot smarter. And that is my last slide. And I still have, I think, about five minutes for questions. Any questions out there? I can barely see anybody out here. Nobody's moving their hands up anywhere? I can't tell. No, no. Anybody? Anybody? I don't believe I finished early. Okay, good. Did she get this ready? Uh, hi. Hi. In the dark there. <laughs> hey, uh, how do you compare Dart to, say, TypeScript? Uh, I think they're kind of aiming for the same thing, right? Not really. The problem with TypeScript is that it is still JavaScript. So you have all the 17 ways to say false in JavaScript and all those crazy things. All the anomalies of JavaScript aren't hidden. Dart is a completely separate language. So you get a language that's strong and reasonable. It doesn't have to be backward compatible with JavaScript at all. So I, 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 I said in the beginning of the talk, it, you, there, are, there are these things that try to sit on top of JavaScript, and I think they're not quite going far enough. Does that help? Anybody else? Or are you all anxious to get out to the party? You should never say that twice, right? Yes? One more? OK. It's really, really dark out there. From, I've got these lights right in my eyes. All I can see is there's a sea of people out there. OK? Hello. Hi. Uh, what about uh, ES6? Is it ready for? Um, I, th I don't know. I think there are some uh, early releases of it right now. I think it's still also going through standardization. But again, ES6 has to be backward compatible with every quirk of JavaScript back to the dawn of time. Everything that Brandon wrote in his first release still has to run in ES6. And that's the great thing about Dart is you're actually jumping ship. You're going to a completely new language, but it's still going to be compatible with all the modern browsers. And as, as JavaScript gets smarter, some of the translations are going to be easier to do. Like some of the things that they're doing the hard way now with uh, observing variables that change underneath, like for Angular and, and, uh, and Polymer, they'll be able to do easier as it goes along. And uh, Dart will also graduate as, as the underlying ECMAScripts uh, get better and better. So it'll, it'll, you know, the rising tide will lift all boats. Hi. Hi. Here. Uh, there. Okay. I hear some rumor about Dart to replace Java on Android de 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 development. Oh, is that is that in English? I'm sorry, you have a really thick accent. Hi. Is that in English? Uh, I'll, I'll read it for him. Well, I've got, okay, I've got this. I think I can make this work. I'll read it in English. Oh, okay. Hi, I hear a rumor about Dart replacing uh, Java or on Android development. Do you know something about that? Thanks. The Java you... on Amber? What? Or Amber? <laughs> Ember? Just a second. Oh, and on Android. Android. Java on Android. Android. Oh, what this will do is it will make it easy to write completely web-based applications that have the same slickness, the same abilities as the native apps do. They're already doing some very smart apps uh, for, that are automatically cross-platform between iOS and Android because they're just web apps. And yet the web stuff is moving so far forward and the programmability is working so well that uh, it's just, it, it's like why program in Java and, uh, and uh, Objective-C or whatever the latest thing is, Swift, when you can just write it in one language and debug it on your desktop and then deploy. So yeah, does that help? Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I think you just already answered. Uh, I was going to ask you if the, the language is ready to run on, mo on mobile. Yeah, th there's, that's definitely a goal. And the web, um, 
the HTML library already understands uh, touch and motion uh, stream events, so it's designed. It's, they, this is Google. They want to be everywhere. So they're building stuff to make sure it runs everywhere. So uh, that's the great thing about Google having started this project is if somebody else had not had done it, it might not have had all the same motivations to be everywhere and in your browser and on your phone and in your tablet and everything else. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? How does Dart uh, integrate with uh, libraries like jQuery and Angular? Like, I can just say the last word again, like what? How does Dart integrate with libraries like jQuery and Angular? Do, does it have oh, oh, oh. Native, uh, native implementations or can it call the libraries? Uh, there's JavaScript interoperability. So you can bring a, a JavaScript object in and it sits behind a wrapper that proxies everything back and forth to JavaScript. Uh, also though, you'll find you'll be reach, reaching for jQuery a lot less because you can write the same thing in Dart much easier and it has that same sort of look up something, get access to all the elements. I think the interface is actually even easier than jQuery does and that says a lot because the jQuery interface I have definitely been in love with for like the last four years. So I'm very happy now to be moving towards Dart for my HTML development. Thanks. Yeah. I think I've got time for uh, one more question, one final question. And then off to the bus. Anyone? 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 Scared him away when I did that, sorry. No, no, no. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And go out and play with Dart. Go play with Dart. Tell, tell everybody. <laughs>